I haven't heard from Linda Linda King. I hope I do get to hear from Lisa or Linda King. Um, they were the um, girls that grew up in the Gator Inn, and sometime one of them saw Ted Bundy as a child for the for one of their daughters. Uh, I don't know if it's Linda's daughter or Lisa's daughter. Now let's go back to 1967 when I was 12 years and nine months. I realized something today on this. The Freedom of Information Act, I don't know if I'm going to get the report on the Virginia Helms case or not. Uh, they said I couldn't have it, but it was going to be referred to the correct cold case unit. Why can't, if I rode in Bundy's car, wouldn't it be good for me to read the report and see if I see something? I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to dissuade the witnesses. But anyway, whatever. I probably never hear from Linda. Uh, this is the way it goes. But I, it was a spontaneous uh, uh, item of speech from her daughter. I found when the sale was in 74. Let's say he came up in 68 after the GOP convention. Then he already had a connection to Duval. Um, let me go back to 1967 when Debbie and I ran into him at Jeb Stewart. Um, she was lollygagging in front of the baseball grounds. She was wearing a peasant top and blue jeans that were cut off and frayed. Possibly sandals on her hair was in a bob and had dyed sienna. Um, I never was there in the evenings at her home because that was a time Mrs. Ho, Mrs. Sexton would get ready because she worked in a nightclub. So she would get ready. You don't want to be there. She's getting ready for work. She worked evenings. Uh, she was an entertainer. Maitre d', the, red, the heart of Jacksonville. So we run into him. My reaction is he's got an out-of-state name. We ran into him. I said, no, Debbie, don't get in. No, no, it's just pretend. I was just pretending the hitchhike. And she's going to get in the car. And she gets in, you know, she starts to get in. I say, all right, well, whatever. I've got to stay with my friend. Don't talk to strangers, you know. He looked like a Lieutenant JG. He was wearing khaki-colored shorts. That's what threw in the Navy, had an out-of-state tag. And we're coming around the corner, and I said, there's books back here. He said, just move the books. Just move the books. And then he turned at LaMoya, and he pulled the revolver out at West Gannett. Then Debbie was silent. And then I started talking. I said, you know, Debbie's father's an admiral. You ought to meet Mickey, Mickey and Jeannie. You ought to, they're so pretty and they're already out on their own. If you're looking for girls, you need to go up to the high school. And then when I said he was an admiral, I didn't realize, you know, Mrs. Hogue had always said, my husband's a CO. He's command, you know, he's, he's CO1, CO2, CO. My dad was a chief petty officer, an aircraft mechanic, ADC. And Mr. Mr. Davis, my other friend's father, was an electrician. I think they called it a warrant officer or something. They were both Navy, but I guess they weren't COs. So I, I said, Debbie's father's an admiral at NASA. I think just the comedy of that may have somehow thrown Bundy back. And then I said, what is your name? And he said, Theodore. And I'm looking at my clarinet, and I said, what is your last name? And he said, Bundy. Theodore Bundy. Red Volkswagen wasn't supposed to be here. It was to be out in Al Paul Alta going to Stanford on a free uh, eight weeks course starting June 24th or 25th. So he's way out of place, but it was him. I mean, <laughs> there's no doubt in my mind it was him. But we got to the Texaco station at Harlow and Blanding, and he let us out. Debbie arranged for that. She started talking to when I talked because I think the feeling was he needs, he changed. When he pulled the gun, his eyes went black. His eyebrows seemed to go across his forehead. You have never in my life seen anything like I saw in that rear view mirror, but I did not get upset. I just talked and I talked and I talked about, you know, how pretty Vicky and Jeannie were. Okay. So we move on and I didn't think my shirt mattered because I said, I'm probably wearing that surfer shirt, but I just realized something. I had this bright red cotton shirt with a little, um, I'm going to try to little yoke and it had like a, a three buttons there and a, a tiny little collar the size of a pencil. It was white. The shirt was red. And later I have a picture in August when my Aunt Opal and my Aunt Bobby and my Grandma Conley are out at Mayport. And we went to Mayport. And I'm wearing that shirt. And I just realized what Debbie did. Okay. A few days. I was so grateful. He let us out. 
she opened the hinge on the seat and pulled it forward, the little white pick thing, and I got out. And I was so happy. And, and I said, well, he's got an out-of-state tag. And I was a little scared because I think we'll go see um, Gene at the 7-Eleven, you know, in case we need to see somebody because he was like 30-something. Well, he was young, but he wasn't real young. But, but he had a phone. There was a pay phone, and we could run over to Gene if anything else happened. But he went, and, and he headed that towards town to the north. I it sat, yeah, to the north. Anyway, that little red boat's way and went on. He, you know, that was it. That's a story. That's it. Now, a few days later, I went to see Kathleen by the bee tree, the wisteria. And I said, I've written it in my diary. And then Debbie happened to show up. And she went ballistic. She says, you can't have it in your diary. Your mom will read your diary and will get in big trouble. Well, I'm a susceptible kid, 12 years now. And she said, you have to rip it out. Well, I can read part of it. I can read college, bright red, talking to, and there looks like a TH, a B, and a Y. But it was ripped out and put in the fence post. And I got to thinking about why was she so ballistic? Was she protecting herself and me? I said, my mom doesn't read my diary. I could put it on the bookshelf in my room. I had other books, all kind of books. You know, uh, the little girls that were detectives and drew the drew books or whatever i had golden books i don't kind of books she, she my mom was not gonna run around and i hardly wrote anything in it anyway it's mostly blank and i'm thinking that's stupid i'm not gonna get in trouble we didn't do anything wrong i was just pretending to hitchhike i was just pretending because you were lollygagging i was going to try to catch you a ride i suppose if it had been some boy from the neighborhood it would have been all right but you know i didn't feel like i'd done anything i was going to get in that big of trouble so, my dad would get two weeks off every year, and I wasn't really all that. I think I learned to play the little brown jug on my clarinet. That was about it. I did. I was doing pretty good. The, the lady liked my tones and stuff. Um, Rose, uh, Rose, Ross, Roslyn, Joyce Roslyn, or whatever her name was. Anyway, <clears throat> so time went on. I always felt like, well, this guy had an out-of-state tag. He said he was college. He said he was college. I said, are you in the Navy? He said, college. So I figured he's gone. He's not coming back. He's out of state. Whatever his problem is, he's gone. I think Debbie was protecting him. She knew that I'm not going to hang around to the six and seven o'clock hour. I had to, I went home with my dinner. We had dinner, father, mother, brother, and, and you know, and the four of us would have dinner at a certain time in the evening. I'm not going to miss dinner or whatever, you know. My mom was a good cook, and I would go home, you know. So, and there wasn't nothing to do at that time in the evening, particularly the hose, because Miss Hogue would be getting ready to go her thing, and she was half nuts anyway. You don't hang around there. It's like being in Joan Crawford's house or something, you know, the hell. So um, I wouldn't have noticed anything over there. I think she invited him over to her house. And then their relationship was formed. I, I, this is speculation, but some reason, why would you be that ballistic? I'm not going to get in that big of trouble for doing something. I said it was pretend the whole time. So I did it. The little red shirt. I wasn't going to be in band much longer. First of all, I've got a picture of that shirt in August, and this was June. He had to go back to, on his way to Stanford at some point, because this was about June 5th, 6th, 7th. If he decided to form a friendship with them and he could get money for traveling that way, see, he was a poor, um, and he was just, maybe he told Debbie, I was just trying to set the, I don't ever want y'all to hitchhike again. I was trying to set the fear of you, you know, whatever. And so he makes a dinner arrangement so he can meet this beautiful girl. Because I said, oh, they're so pretty and they're already out on their own. And, and Jeannie was beautiful. We're talking like a young Liz Taylor or Audrey Hepburn or, Rita Marino, kind of mix them together, and you have Jeannie. And she was quite liberal. She burned her bras up in 68 up at the, uh, whatever it was called, the beauty pageant in New Jersey or whatever it was. Atlantic City, yeah. So the red shirt, because my dad and mom would go to Daytona that year with me, must have gone to Daytona. So when I was in Daytona, I got to get that surfer shirt. I called it the surfer shirt. I didn't have it in the first part of June. I had it later that year. So we picked it up, and we were out of town. So any kind, and he had to leave shortly. So I'm away. I don't realize she set up a relationship with him in some kind of fashion. Then he takes off to go back to California. And then um, what he had to do with the Gator Inn, I don't know. <laughs> 
<coughs> the following year, he's back in Florida for the National G GOP convention. Somewhere between 67 and 69, Jeannie was pregnant. Why? What in the world? There are things that he, oh, and then the, here's some circumstances that were odd. We'd go to the roller derm, and Debbie says, no, we got to go across the street to the bowling alley. And there was a whole situation where a girl fell off the fender of a car and cracked her head on the cement, and the guy had an open case of beer, and it was like a it was like a white '54 Impala, you know, with a red interior and the and convertible, and, he, and then the girl sitting up on his fender, and he panicked, he hit the gas, and she flops on the thing, and I'm thinking, why are we over here in the bowling alley when we're supposed to be roller skating? So I don't know what her meeting was. One time we were sleeping in Kathleen's shed as a sleepover, and Debbie says, "I'm going to see Mark." John Householder. I said, well, you're not supposed to sneak out to see some guy. You know, we're, you know, 12 or 13. Why are you sneaking out to see some guys? And we looked at the stars. How do I know where she went? She was doing stuff that I didn't like. You know, she, um, at her 16th birthday party, there was liquor. There was a guy passed out in the tub in, in, in the garage. And I'm thinking, this is not good. What if the water comes on? He's passed out in his tub, you know. And then she jumped on a motorcycle. She didn't know how to start it. She didn't know how to stop it. She crashed it into the grass. I said, no, I'm not getting on it. No. You know, and I began to say no to some of these things that were just, you know. And then then she comes and said she had a three-page letter she had to give some guy at the Riviera Apartments. About a year later, <clears throat> he was wearing, like, corduroy uh, bell bottoms and a white turtleneck shirt. He had longer hair. I couldn't say it was the same guy that was in the car because I didn't equate it. The guy in the car was GQ. He wasn't wearing a shirt, but he had a real nice haircut, and he patted the steering wheel after he put the gun somewhere. I think, in my mind, in my mind, Bonnie, if you're listening to this, that something went on with a family because why? Would there be all, and why was she so vehement about that? I think my mom, my mom wouldn't have really done anything. So you should have never done that, you know, or maybe I, I even maybe have an inclination to tell my dad that there's some weirdo going around pulling guns on kids, you know, instead Debbie's saying, let's not talk about it. We'll get in big trouble. And then I think, and I was thinking, well, maybe because her parents were divorcing and she didn't want to end up with the other parent. Then Later on, as we're maturing and becoming young adults, Debbie was in a rush to get out of high school. I think she was in, like, the International Baccalaureate. Some, she did something so she could get out. Early. She was already ahead of time because she was almost shouldn't have been in that grade. She should have been a grade behind me because she was born in November, so she probably should have started a year later. But anyway, so I got out at 17 myself. But anyway, she she was seven. She got out of high school early. But she and Vicki, the, the middle child, and Vicky probably was in college by then, and Debbie was probably middle. She never did finish up at, at Forest. I don't know how she got out of high school, but anyway, she became a BSN and, and, and a nurse, and she spent her career doing that. But there at Kathleen's house, and it must have been, it seemed like the holidays or something. She says, oh, I'm learning to ski. My first thing is, what are ski, you know? And she says, no, I've got to learn to ski. We're going to Colorado to ski or something like that because their father had given them a semester in Austria because he was a commanding officer and had the money. And this was a gift of Vicky and, and Debbie. And they were going to spend either one of them a high school semester and maybe another one a college semester. And they were going to go together to Austria, but they needed to learn to ski. And I think that may have played into it too. But I, I so what? I'm working at Blue Cross and Blue Shield. You know, I'm, I'm going to school in the evening, whatever. Uh, you know, it wasn't uh, Kathleen skiing tour and knee gave out on her. It's oh, it's something exciting. It's, that's why. Also, I don't know why Kathleen won't talk. Mrs. Davis would have talked. My mom would have said something. My dad would have said something. Johnny knew about it. He came back from Vietnam, and I said, you know, there's horrors that go on here because I had worked at JSO, and I said they're not like constant bombing of a, of a of a haunch or whatever they call it in Vietnam or your or your fort. No, it's not like that. It's not constant but it's intermittent, intermittent horrors, intermittent knifings, intermittent man stabs his wife with a Coke bottle, intermittent somebody hits a child with a Levi belt buckle and imprints it on the thing, um, intermittent kids huffing gasoline, um, intermittent kids cuffing glue, intermittent uh, two homosexuals knife it out. You know, I mean, just, you know, or a guy hangs himself till he's putrefied. I said, there's things here. 
but they're intermittent. Or, or somebody's decapitated in a car wreck. I mean, they're, they're here, Johnny. <laughs> they're just more spread out and continuous. It never ends. It's not like the war's over and then ends and it's over. But anyway, I tried to explain that to him. I said, and then I tried to explain all the guys that were lost. I said, so they may have been, they may have been kindergarten teachers. They may have been uh, tire changers and mechanics. They may have been a masonry, but they're dead. And you've got to live on. You can't live in the past of the people that have died before you. You've got to move on. You've got to put your foot in front of the other, you know. Because he had talked about suicide one time when he was younger, and he said he couldn't, for some reason he didn't want to do it because the Army told him not to do it or something. Else. Um. But if any one of them were alive, they could tell you that this happened. But they're not here. So there was a continuing association with Bunny, despite what Mr. Sullivan said. Oh, I'm sorry. You're mistaken. Well, <laughs> you're sure as hell not mistaken. Not mistaken. And if I can get this corroboration from one of the King family members of something written down. Now, if it came in 68, that doesn't matter. That's still good because that was after 67. And it was a political motel. Um, the right wing and the left wing, those for consolidation, those not for consolidation, they would all meet in the banquet hall there. The, when they were running for office, they met at the Gator Inn. It was just like uh, it was a place to go if you were going to be a pol 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 political. So anyway, this is what we're waiting on. You know. All right. Thank you.